Hey guys. Hi, Hi Frank. Howdy. Hi, Frank. How are you? Spring chickens. Good. If there's anything we can do, Lucas. No, I, I just had like my I felt like my head was going to explode every minute. Ooh. And I couldn't get up just because it felt like there was like a ton of weight just falling on my head every time I got up or moved. His mother and grandmother have got it. Sorry to hear that, Lucas. Oh, I yep. think there's a, there's a pattern. There's definitely a pattern. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sadly, yeah. we're, we're a reflection. Yeah. Yeah, the craziness in the world, unfortunately, has been reflected in the church in many re respects, unfortunately. Instead of being a bulwark or a prophet, which stands separately from it, we have often reflected some of the controversies that you find in the world and, and, um, and have embraced some, unfortunately, but <clears throat> that's the work that, uh, God is wanting to do. Um, he's wanting to reform us and bring us into harmony with himself. So it's not unsurprising. It is disappointing, but <clears throat> not unsurprising. Well, that's, that's good, because that's actually going to be part of tomorrow's sermon topic. Yeah. <laughs> so that actually is going to be part of it, because, you know, once you see the, one of the stories that I'll be talking about tomorrow in, in the scriptures and what it meant for Israel, you'll realize what it means for us. And, and yes, you're right. We, because of the parallels that you see in the Bible, it, it gives us the playbook, and it also tells us that God doesn't abandon his people, even if they tend to turn their backs on him. He's still working. He's still doing things. It doesn't mean that everyone who has been baptized in the church is going to be saved, but what it does mean is that the avenue of his grace, which is the church, he's going to be working through to the end of time. So, a lot of things will change as they did clearly in the old Testament and even in the new for God's people, but he will still continue to work through his people. He always has and always will. Uh, if, if there's anything else you guys want to say before we go ahead and pray and get started, uh, is there, and also, is there anything that uh, we should mention specifically in prayer? Especially Frank. The Ukraine. Yes, yeah. thank you. I spoke with um, my son-in-law's Ukraine, and um, I spoke with, well, his mom and I, we get together and do the grandma prayer thing once a week, and they have a lot of family over there, and it's, you know, the people are really kind of frightful right now. For, for a lot friends. of them are leaving. Yeah, yeah. I, it's one of those things where <clears throat> I know that there's a lot of political nuance with what is happening in Ukraine. I mean, I, I've listened to both sides of the discussion. But one thing that is not up for debate is that the people who tend to suffer the most are those who don't have guns and just wanted to live a normal life. That's really who suffers the most. The people who suffer from bombs and power outages and lack of uh, food and medical supplies aren't usually the people who are wearing uniform. It's usually the people, the innocent people are often caught and the vulnerable people are often caught in between the fighting lines. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's quite terrible. And, you know, if you think about it, we have people on both sides of the conflict. In other words, we have believers in Russia and we have believers mm -hmm. in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And it, <clears throat> one of those things where we definitely want to pray for them. And on top of that, you know, I'm sure that in time there will be refugees and there will be people, uh, another mass movement and hopefully there will be ways of helping them so they're not trafficked by the the un or something like that so <clears throat> and i and, and and i'm not saying that because i don't like the un i'm saying that because that's actually a fact that actually did happen has happened and probably will continue to happen because one of the greatest industry industries is human trafficking modern slavery what and i i don't mean to go off but 
one of the things that people said about the book of Revelation is it talks about slaves being there to the end of time. And everyone thought, well, since 1865, the worst form of slavery that ever was ended then. That's that's at the end of the Civil War, the American slavery. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that that wasn't the worst slavery. And the worst slavery that exists is the slavery that exists today. Children who are trafficked in slavery today have one of three fates. One, they will be worked to death. They will work, you know, making mud bricks or working as a domestic until they pretty much die. Two, they will be sold into sex slavery, where they will be forced to sleep with all kinds of things, men, women, and things. And, and sometimes they will be video recorded and all those other terrible things. That's, that's one, the, the other fate is that they will harvest their organs. And, and I'm not making any of this up. One of the largest organizations which fights human trafficking uh, Operation Underground Railroad has stipulated this, testified before this, before Congress. And so modern slavery exists in greater effect today. Truly what the book of Revelation says, slave or free, at the end of time is true is real it really is and we have ignored it for whatever reason none of them which are good and so anytime you have war anytime you have disaster you will have human trafficking one of the key points and i'm sorry to go off on this i apologize but one of the key things that happened many of you remember the earthquake in haiti well the the human traffickers set up a fake orphanage so people would bring kids who may have lost their parents in the earthquake, thinking they were doing the right thing to this orphanage. And it turned out that they were then selling those kids on the market. So you have to realize that it's often the innocent who suffer. And this is why we pray. And this is why we should work to actually do things that are legitimate and stand for causes that are actually legitimate. Um, I'm sorry for all that, but Amen. it is true. And that is exactly what the Bible says, that slavery will continue to the end of time. And it is very much alive to this day. So <clears throat> with that said. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard to know that place because we so don't want to be political, politically charged. And yet there are things that are so worth standing up for. Yeah, I support Exodus Cry and they fight against the, the sex trafficking. And Absolutely. And think about it right now, the Equality Act. The Equality Act is basically telling the universities and other institutions that you can't discriminate if someone identifies as a different gender. Well, while we may affirm that public schools or whatever may not have that right, the problem is the Equality Act says that if you were even are your religious oriented school, you can't discriminate. Well, that actually violates any moral code of conduct that any school who takes the Bible seriously would have. And, and unfortunately, that is both a moral issue, it is a religious issue, and it is also a political issue. I wish that we could separate these things out, but unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. And, and this, is a, this is an issue that is coming to bite us severely because we have and you i know you know this susan is that we have students who are identifying as a different sex than what they were born with and wanting to live a certain lifestyle and they will hold the university's feet to the fire because of this legislation and that they need to be supported and treated even though it violates every moral code of conduct that is based loosely on the bible so Unfortunately, there's always going to be that political line. I mean, think about it in communist in communist Romania, communist Russia, communist Eastern Bloc, any of those places, just talking about the creation of the world by 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 Jesus, uh, you know, through whom all things were created was political. That was seen as subversive to uh, the new scientific age, the the political regime. Uh wanting to share the Bible in the language of the common people back then, even then, was considered uh, a crime. Uh, it, was, it was political because it was an attack on Marxism and communism and the new regime. So, yeah, it's never, it's never going to be neatly separated. And unfortunately, if we don't learn to put the Bible first, then we'll be divided on politics rather than being divided on truth. And it's better to be divided on truth, as Jesus 
uh, succinctly said, I have not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. But that sword is the word that comes out of his mouth, which is truth. So that's what he came to bring. And that does divide. And we'd rather be divided on that than who we voted for ignorantly elections ago. So, all right. Now we're going to pray. <laughs> all right. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Gracious and heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your holy scriptures. They really do help us, Lord, to frame everything that we're seeing in its proper sphere and to understand the things that you want to show us from heaven. Help us, Lord, to put these in our hearts that we would grow close to you, especially in these last days. We ask, Lord, that you be with uh, Pastor Frank, that you comfort him, that you be with his wife, Susan, that you be with his whole support system around him. <clears throat> that you would help him to get through this time and, and give him the courage and wisdom of how to face things that sometimes you're just not in control of. Lord, we thank you so much for answering the prayers that we have said here um, and, and keeping us safe and restoring health and all the things that you have done. Help us never to forget just how much kindness and mercy you've shown to us and to also know as we look in the scriptures that you will not leave us or forsake us that you will stand with us in the midst of the storm. You won't take us out of it, but you will stand with us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. 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 So I, I as normal, I'm going to mute everyone. You're welcome to unmute yourself and comment anytime. Don't worry about interrupting me. Conversation's great. But we're going to start here at uh, Hebrews chapter 8. So I'm going to mute everyone. And then if you want to contribute or say or anything, comment, question, Feel free to unmute yourself. All right. <clears throat> so now we're at Hebrews chapter eight, and we're starting. Uh, we're starting in verse one. All right. So here we are. He says this. Now this is the main point of such things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of Majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which the Lord erected not man. Now, I, I just, I just want to stop here. Why is it that, why is it that he's pointing out that we have such a high priest that is on the right hand of magic and the right hand of majesty, the throne of majesty. And he points out that he is a minister of the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, not man. Why is he saying that? Why is it that he's making this point to, to his audience? Why do you think that's important? to his audience or for him to say it because there's one in heaven too right there's one in heaven too but what does that mean Re remember and he's going to say this later on but what was the earthly what was the earthly based on remember and he i believe he cites it here pattern after the heavenly that's right and as, as a matter of fact that's what he says in verse five that is a pattern of the heavenly. That's what he actually says. And what he's saying is, is that Jesus, our high priest, who is able to clean us from dead works, is able to bring us into true fellowship with heaven, isn't cleaning, isn't ministering in a place that is merely a shadow. He's ministering in the reality, in the actual, and the very thing that this massive temple was patterned of and the furniture was patterned after, that thing that, that we see in his day, which they did, that thing is merely a shadow. It is merely a, a form or a pattern or an object lesson of the reality of what our high priest is doing. This is why he, again, is greater. Every point, and yes, I know that, that I will keep pointing this out because that's what he's doing, so you understand it, and it almost gets taxing, but notice he's doing it over and over and over again that you understand, that you understand that we really do, just as the, there was an earthly tabernacle and an earthly temple, just as that existed, just as the vision was given to Moses and given to Solomon to build these things, there is a real one in heaven. And this real one in heaven is using is, is where the blood of Jesus is being applied 
to each and every one of us. It, the real one in heaven is where the prayers are actually ascending before the throne on high, not before a box, which represents the throne, but actually before the presence of God. And so this is why he keeps hammering this home, that he's saying your faith is not in a mystical thing. It's in a reality of which we have a shadow before us. That we can take heart that as they had built a temple and as they had built a tabernacle, there is a real place in heaven where the throne of the heavenly father is and the high priest, Jesus Christ, ministers. That's his point, And he drives it home. Let's go to verse three. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he, meaning Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So at every turn, he's demonstrating that faith in Christ is greater and on a more sure foundation than faith in the shadows, which they took comfort in. You know, this is always the difficulty with building anything that is based on a pattern that is tangible. We have this unfortunate, inherent, I don't know, draw to worship things that we have made with our hands, even if it is based on something that's supposed to be heavenly. Look around the world. There are giant statues that men and women worship and do, go do pilgrims. Some are of allegedly of the Christian faith. They are Catholic, and they will go to what is it, the Lady of Guadalupe, and they will kiss the toes of a statue named Mary. They they have gone for years to St. Peter's Basilica, and they kissed the toe off of Peter so much. I mean, think about it. Peter was made out of marble, and they kissed it so much that they had to create at least three or four toes to replace the ones that were worn out by lips kissing it. There's something in man that wants things to be tangible, touchable, and we want to visualize it and see it. And even though God condescended to us to build a tabernacle, to have a priesthood, you have to remember that most of that wasn't even visible during the service. It wasn't. He wanted for all time for us to do what? To trust in his promises, to trust in his word. This is why the second commandment is so powerful. It says, do not make for yourself any carved image of anything in the likeness of heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to the thousands that love me and keep my commandments. That is the second commandment. He never wanted man to worship an object. And what had happened at this time is that the people, the Jews and the Pharisees and Sadducees, along with the leadership, had put so much stock in the actual building that they rejected the Messiah, who the building was to point to. Remember that long ago that Moses had nailed up a bronze serpent on a pole. And when people would look at it, they would live after being bit by fiery serpents, right? And what happened years down the road? They began to worship that very bronze serpent, believing that it was God, and they called it Nehushtan, which simply meant bronze thing or bronze God. And eventually, I believe it was Josiah, or no, I think it was Hezekiah, who had to destroy it because they continued to worship it. They couldn't accept that the, the greater reality of that serpent was to point to a sin-suffering Messiah. This is the struggle of our faith. We always want something tangible. We want something that we feel, that we taste, that we touch. But God is saying, no, look with eyes of faith. If you do that, you will not be shaken. 
This is the whole point that Paul is hammering home, that this thing that you see is merely a shadow of a greater reality above which you do not see. And so anyways, why is that important? Because the work that is being done in the heavenly sanctuary is to have a corresponding work on human hearts, which is why we believe in the importance of 1844. It's not just the heavenly sanctuary that's being cleansed. It is God's people that are to be cleansed. And this is, this is part of the new covenant that we see here. Notice how it begins in verse 7. This is taken from Jeremiah 31. And he says, For that the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, which I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them into their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, I just want to stop there. I know that many of you have friends who, who you, you can talk to about the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me or the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself any carved image or the third commandment. You shall not take the Lord's, the Lord, thy God's name in vain for the Lord will not hold his um, guiltless who takes his name in vain. And then you can go to the fifth commandment, honor thy mother and thy father, that your days may be long in the land, which the Lord, your God is giving you. You can go to the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. Then you can go to the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. You can go to the eighth commandment. You shall not steal. You can go to the ninth commandment, which is it's not thou shall not lie, but it is thou shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, right? And you go to the tenth commandment, which is about coveting. You could go to all of them except for one, and and your friend who is not a Seventh Day Adventist will agree with you that all of them are important and they have value to this very day. But when you point to the fourth one, they say, well, whoa, 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 the law's done away with. You're, you you do not you don't really have to obey. It's all obeyed in Jesus. You don't have to do anything, but here's the point. Here's the point. Paul is citing, citing Jeremiah, who is getting this directly from God, saying that in the new covenant, the law isn't done away with. It's actually written on your heart. It's actually to be written in your heart and in your mind that you are to become in harmony with it. Far from being destroyed, it's actually to enter the tabernacle of your life. That's what it's to do. And this is one of the strongest evidences that the Lord never intended that the law would be done away with. If he intended that, then this passage means absolutely nothing. If the cross did away with the law, then this passage means absolutely nothing. And Allegedly, they argued the very author of this book, who I believe is the Apostle Paul, is the one who makes the argument that the law was nailed to the cross and done away with. If that's so, then why is he making this argument here that the law is to be written in your hearts? And this is greater than the very covenant that God had made with his people when he brought them out of Egypt, when the law was merely written on tables of stone. In other words, the very transcript of God's character, which was written on stone, is the very thing that he wants to write on human hearts. That is the fulfillment, if that's the word. That just sums that all up. That is the fulfillment of it. And what's impressive about this, what's impressive about this is the context in which this prophecy was given. The context in which the pro this prophecy was given was given in the middle, midst of a corrupt political regime in Israel. It was given in the midst of nobles, and rulers who had taken advantage of the poor, widows, and fatherless. This was given while there was that while there was still a mingling of idols in the very temple. This was given when people were directly ignoring oracles from God. This was given when uh, Jeremiah had given testimony, and the king decided to cut pieces of the message that Jeremiah had given and have them thrown in the flame. This was given looking forward to a time when all the corruption that you would see in Judah and in Israel would be wiped out because the gospel would conquer. That's how powerful this, this testimony is. That's how powerful uh, the vision was that Jeremiah was given. This was all about 
cleansing and purifying and bringing God's people in harmony with himself, where he can write the transcript of his character on their hearts. That's what he wanted to do. And this is why he goes on, verse 11, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none of them his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Now, I love this because notice this, that the, having the transcript of God's character written in your hearts to become like Christ on this earth is also, it, it, how would I put it? It is also corresponds with your sins being forgiven and your unrighteous deeds remembered no more. Your lawless deeds remembered no more. This was something that could not be done while the tabernacle stood, while the temple stood. It wasn't, it wasn't until the blood of Jesus had made the way plain that the, that the goal of the covenant to bring men back to the image of God, to write the transcript of God's character in our hearts, it could only be done through the blood of Jesus, through his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, which is what we believe is happening now. And we believe that this is precisely what God is wanting to do. And we also believe that this is why we have a special message in, in Revelation 14, uh, in verse 6, starting with the first angel, uh, talking about fear God and give glory to him for his hours of judgment has come and worship him who's created the heavens, the earth, and the sea and the water and everything in it, we believe that we have a special message for this time because we're pointing back to this law, which God is wanting to write in our hearts. We're pointing back to the Sabbath, which points to God as our creator, our redeemer, and our restorer. And this is why it is so important that we talk about the law unashamedly because this is part of the gospel. It's to be written in our hearts. It's to bring us in harmony with him. It's to help cleanse us of all unrighteousness and restore to helps. man. What's it that? It also helps uh, perfect our character because that's the only thing we take to heaven. That's all we take to heaven, your character. There's nothing here on this earth that you take. Absolutely. But you're absolutely right. It is all about our character. And we see that that character is being developed through the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. This is why when we when we talked about the importance of 1844, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, we must recognize that there is a work going on in heaven, but there is a corresponding work that must also happen here on earth. As we know, we are all stones fit together to build the house. And this is also why we talk about each one of us being a temple of what? The Holy Ghost. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit. And this all corresponds with the new covenant. And this is exactly why this promise here is can be fulfilled because of what Jesus has done, what he is doing, and what he will do in his return. All right, let's go on to chapter nine. It says this, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For the tabernacle was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiness, the holiest of all, which had the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the, gold, in which were the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded in the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim, of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot now speak in great detail. I, I, I love this because he gives all the furniture and all of these things are holy, holy, holy. But notice what he says. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for other people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating that this way into the holiest of all was not made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. This is interesting because what happened at the crucifixion of Jesus? 
when he gave up the ghost, as it says. Do you remember what happened? Besides the earthquake? The temple um, uh, curtain was ripped in half. The temple veil tore in two, right? And notice what he's making the point, that the way now was open. That and, and, and this is important because the high priest could not easily go in there. He was only allowed to go in there once a year. And he had to make a sacrifice for himself in order to go because he could be killed. But Jesus doesn't have to do that year by year. He can go any time because he is perfect. He is our high priest. He is without sin, and he offers his perfect blood. And yet, he was as much man as any of us here, and so he can perfectly represent all humanity before the throne without it being destroyed. Question. Yes. I was just curious. It just came to me. When the temple um, curtain was ripped from top to bottom down here, do you think that it's open in heaven now too? Why? Well, I, I don't think there was a curtain in heaven. I think that the curtain was to tell you that the way had not been, but there, I don't think there was ever a curtain in heaven. It's just that the high priest had not, was not, how would I put it, ready for his work. He had to come here and he had to die. But ours so I, was a pattern from the one above. Right. But 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 let's be clear, right? The the cherubim in heaven probably aren't, I, I don't know, 14 inches tall. And there probably isn't a pot of manna in heaven. Uh, and Aaron's bud was not originally there. Aaron's rod that budded was probably not originally there either, right? Right. Those Wouldn't things the are curtain, the curtain yeah. had um, angels all on it, didn't it? Embroidered in it or something? Isn't there something? So wouldn't that represent that, the that, angels? That, that, the that, that would probably represent the, the heavenly court, right? The host. Mm -hmm. And and there is, a, a, keep in mind that the the veil represented the, the uh, humanity of Christ, which had been torn asunder. In other words, the thing that separated, that separated the holy from the most holy was sinful humanity. And that was nailed to the cross. And that is what bore the curse. And that being having the punishment meted out on our high priest, there was no need to have any separation in heaven. Yeah. I mean, look there, there, I, I do believe there's a, uh, there's a lot of differences. For instance, it, even though you have the altar of incense, which would put forth smoke, which was to represent the prayers of the saints and things like that. Well, if you read in Revelation 15, that the glory of God fills the temple with so much smoke that nobody can even be in there. Nobody can even be in there. There, there is a manifest difference in both. One is a pattern and the other is the reality. And as far as, as, far as my understanding of it, that there would be no need for a veil because the high priest who would officiate there was not sinful, was not sinful, did not have to be separated. And if you go back to Hebrews, what does he say? He says that he says that the reason why they couldn't go in, sorry, I almost missed it. He says the reason why they couldn't go in, verse nine, it was symbolic for the present time in which, oh yeah, sorry, verse eight, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all had not been yet, had not been made yet manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. So in other words, all those things had to be fulfilled, and then the way was made. Remember in, the, in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, we have a scene in the very throne room that is, and you have the, the four creatures who cry out, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. You have the heavenly host of angels, the 24 elders who sit around and also say, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. And then what do you have? That there was sorrow in heaven because nobody could open up the, the scroll that had seven seals. Nobody could open up. But who opens up? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. That lamb opens it up. And that sort of, and what people believe that is, is not just the book of Revelation, but the entire plan of salvation. That is opened up. That is now an open thing for all mankind because why? Because the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So what I'm saying is, is that there's clearly some things that are different. 
and clearly some lessons, some object lessons in that, in that um, shadow that are to teach us about what is in heaven and what is happening. And so that's, that's how I see it. Uh, there is something I think is interesting. So <clears throat> if you go to Colossians 2, I think it's 2. Let me see. Colossians. Yeah. So I want you to, I just want you to take a, 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 a note of this language here. All right. And, 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 and what he says, and you'll, and uh, let's see if it's also. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just going to read this to you and I'm going to read another verse. I'm going to read the verse from Hebrews. And I, and I want you to see that the similar, there's a similarity of language here. All right. Uh, we, we're, we're not going to go through Colossians two tonight because that's just, that would, that's going to take a lot of time and I would love to, but that's, we're studying Hebrews, but I just want you to see this. So we'll start in, um, verse 13 and you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting requirements that was against us and was contrary to us. And he has taken it all out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. And he had made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Therefore, let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival, new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substances of Christ or the bodies of Christ, let no one defraud you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels, intruding in those things which uh, he has he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. I think that's where I want to end. So notice this. Notice this. So back to Hebrews chapter nine and, and going back to verse eight, the Holy Spirit indicating that this way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience, concerned only with food, drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Now notice, what is the thing that you're not to be judged in, in food and drink regarding new moon sab? New uh, festival, new moon, Sabbath. In other words, this language here, this language that is here, deals with the ordinances of the Jewish religion, and this is precisely what Paul is also talking about mm -hmm. in Colossians. It's the same type of language. These things are shadows. Paul even goes on to say, "Is a shadow." All of this that is connected to the temple, connected to the rituals and things that happened were shadows that pointed to Christ. Those things were the shadow. Christ was the <laughs> substance or the body. That language is purposely the same because it's talking about the same thing. And notice that in chapter eight, he just got done saying that the law was to be written in the heart. So when someone goes to you and says that Colossians 2 is about the Sabbath, they are wrong. They're ignoring the language, which is actually pointing to the shadow service of the temple. Um, I actually have something about that. Um, I've talked about, well, that part of Colossians with friends and all yeah. of that. And um, what I found out that would be useful um, is the that they put the handwriting of ordinances against us and that it's a shadow of things to come. And on Deuteronomy 31, um, um, Moses puts the law hidden, written by him outside the Ark of the Covenant and is saying that it is a handwriting against them. Right. Well, it, it gets it gets even better than that, because in, in Ephesians chapter two, which, yeah, Ephesians two, which is very similar to Colossians two, the, the, the Greek is very similar. Um, it, it, uh, as Sean pointed out uh, last Sabbath, I believe he pointed out that um, uh, Laodicea, uh, which is also mentioned in, in Colossians. Well, Ephesus, Laodicea are on the same are on the same circular are not on the same road which all the letters of Paul would be circulated in which also were the um, letters in the book of revelation also given. And, and so what I'm saying is, is that there were a similarity of themes 
there were things that were pertained to each church. There were differences, but there were a lot of similarities. And so when you read Ephesians 2, what you find is that he not only talks about the things that are against us, but he talks about a wall of separation. And this wall actually existed in the time of the Jews. And this wall said that under pain of death, Gentiles cannot pass through this. In other words, there were things that specifically separated the Gentiles from the Jews. And that is part of that handwriting that is against us because he's writing to people who are also Gentiles and saying, look, this was against you. You don't have to adopt these rituals and things like that. All of that is fulfilled in Christ. No one should judge you if you don't keep those things, which those who were of the Jewish faith still continue to keep. You shouldn't be judged on that at all. And as a matter of fact, all of those things are shadows, but Christ is the substance. And again, I'm only pointing that out because of what he says here in verse 10. Consumed with foods, drinks, various washings, fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. It was understood that those things would be done away with, but the law, which Paul references in chapter 8 of Hebrews, was to be written in the heart, which also, Lucas, you make the point that though that there were things that were written by God's finger, which were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, and there were things that were written by the hand of Moses that were never placed there, which symbolized the difference on one which remains and one which is fulfilled uh, and, and, and is a shadow and points to other things and has principles. So, yeah, it's a good point. All right. Uh one more thing actually before before we move on yeah, um please it's also very useful um when they say but what about the sabbath days there's only one sabbath and it, that's the ten commandments that's not actually true because in leviticus there are many ritualistic sabbaths that you know right. by showing them that and um showing the handwriting against them i actually got some people to believe in the sabbath amen praise the lord that's awesome i'm glad to hear that well, you, you make a good point because there are Sabbaths. There is the seven-year Sabbath. There is the yearly Sabbath. Um, there is the Jubilee Sabbath. And even when you look at the feasts, sometimes some of these feasts are Sabbaths. Uh, the Passover was to be like a Sabbath. You weren't to do any other work. Uh, I believe the Feast of Tabernacles was to be like a Sabbath. You weren't to do any work. The Day, the day of Atonement was to be like a Sabbath. You weren't to do any ordinary work. And so you have these days in there that were to be a Sabbath rest, but they were all distinguished from the weekly Sabbath, which the land needed to have Sabbaths. That's right. The land was, as a matter of fact, what I love about that passage is that the, the Sabbath. So the, the way that the land rested was based on the Sabbath, because what does he say? He says, you shall not do any work, nor you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle nor your strangers within your gate. If you rested your farm equipment, if you rested it, then the land also got rest. And Leviticus 26, the, the specific command is that you, it, it, the curse is if you don't let your land rest, which would be weekly on the Sabbath, yearly, and every seven years, and on the Jubilee, if you don't let your land rest, then I will give it its rest. I will give it its rest, which he did, in the 70 years that they were in captivity before they returned. Amazing. 70 years like the Sabbath before they returned. In Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah gets angry at the, the merchants and the, the, uh, the Jews who are, have returned from exile from buying and selling on the Sabbath. And he says, don't you guys remember what happened to us? that we were thrown out of this land because we did this very thing. In other words, the land was supposed to rest. Man was supposed to rest. The beast of burden were supposed to rest. Why? Because this was to bring everything in harmony with that first Sabbath of creation. So he, yes. And he powerful. even, um, he even, um, was it threatened to lay hands on them? Yes. They, yes, he did. That's exactly it. He even, threaten to lay hands on him. Some believe, some believe that this is where we get the, um, so you know how Jesus says it's easier for the rich man to enter. It's easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Right. And so there's been a debate about this. Some people say, well, no, he literally means a needle. 
and, and, and it literally means a camel. But why say a camel? Some have argued and, and, and some argue that the, that the eye of the needle is actually a, a very narrow gate that was uh, near some, on some of the walls of Jerusalem. So if you got to Jerusalem and the gates were closed, but you wanted to keep the Sabbath in there, the, the, the way was narrow enough that you could enter in, but you couldn't bring your beast to burden. You couldn't bring anything else. You could just merely bring yourself and maybe, you know, change of clothes or whatever, but you couldn't bring anything else. And some people say, well, that doesn't have anything to do with it. But if you go back to what Nehemiah did is he shut the gates and he forced them out, it would make sense then that he would leave a small gate open that you could enter in and you, but you had to leave everything behind, which is also powerful because to enter in the rest with Christ, you have to leave things behind. You have to leave things behind. It's just the way it is. And, and that would have been applicable on the Sabbath day, especially to travelers who might have been getting there just after sundown. And they were, and the gates would be closed and they would have to leave their camels and donkeys or whatever else they were traveling with outside the gate. They were welcome to. Die, we have to leave everything behind. That's it. That's it. It's exactly it. And this is why the Sabbath is so important because it's weekly reminder that we are to step out of the world and leave some things behind for about 24 hours. That's what we're supposed to do. So it, that's why it's a, it's a powerful thing. Anyways, I will back to the Hebrews nine um, <clears throat> verse 11, but Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the, trans, of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. Now, this, this, these few verses are powerful as they are beautiful. Notice the... Notice the, 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 the point that he mandated strictly to make these sacrifices and offerings, everyone knew who looked past the actual ritual understood that there was no way that bleeding an animal into a bowl and sprinkling that blood on a piece of bronze or sprinkling that blood onto a piece of gold or sprinkling that blood around a piece of furniture or burning burning the hide of a red heifer and taking its ashes and mixing it with hyssop and water and, and sprinkling. There's no way that that could actually cleanse the human heart. They understood that all of that symbolized something greater, and that greater would be their Messiah who would die, who would offer his blood for them. And his blood for them would enable them to transcend the dead works, that they would truly be clean, that their conscience would be clean. The idea is, and just as the, just as when we go transition from the old covenant to the new covenant, just as the table of stone where the 10 commandments were written would be in the presence of the people and they would be memorized and they would understand it. The true nature of those commandments was to be written on the heart that his people, his people would reflect his character, that the image of God, which was perfect in Adam when he was created, could be restored to man. But the only way this could happen was through the blood of the true sacrifice, the Messiah, the high priest, the only one who can purge the dead conscience or purge the conscience of dead works. That was the only way it could happen. 
That was the only way. And so notice that the new covenant is greater because it actually can do what the old covenant had hoped for. The old covenant had hoped that through these lessons, through these rituals, through these things that the person participating would understand through faith that there was something greater. And by faith, they could be brought in, in harmony with God and live a victorious life. But now we have the actual we have the actual blood of the covenant, which was shed for each and every one of us, which is now brought into the most holy place where our high priest, who represents all of us, all mankind, stands before the throne without sin to purge us of our dead works and give us eternal life, bringing us in harmony with him. This is why the new covenant is greater this is why the high priest, who is Jesus, is greater. This is why his whole theme is that everything that Christ has done and those sacrifices are all greater because they point to the reality that is in heaven, which the earth was a shadow of. This is powerful. This is powerful. And this is actually what we as Christians want to emphasize that the gospel isn't merely a good couple of slogans, that the Bible isn't something that you read on, on, on child dedications, uh, births, funerals, and weddings. It's not merely that. It is something that can go into the heart and change the life. It is something that can take a man who is fallen and mired in sin and make him not only a child of God, not by mere declaration, but in actuality, where he no longer lives that way. This is, the, this is the one thing that I really enjoyed about coming out ministries. When I talked to the founder of it, and, and I was having a conversation with him, he firmly believes that it's through the power of the gospel that people who've been mired in this impurity and this sin can be transformed. One of my favorite things, this was a, this was a group on Facebook, and it's titled, some were such as, or yeah, some were such as you. And this refers to the passage in, in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about all these sins and he includes homosexuality. And he says, but some were such as you, but you've been washed, but you've been sanctified. You've been purified by the blood of Jesus. In other words, you live that way, but through the blood of Jesus, you don't live that way anymore and you've overcome. And in this, in this Facebook group, they would show these pictures most of these people were not, are not Seventh-day Adventists, but you would see these pictures of women who were dressed like men, looked like men, adopt a lifestyle which was, which was destructive to the image of God that he had put in mankind and living a certain way. And then when they, when they had their road to Damascus experience and they came to find Jesus as their savior, you know what else they found? They found a new life where they were transformed. And you can see the before and after picture where a woman looks just like a man, short hair, tattoos, wearing men's clothes. And then you see the picture where she has a bright, beautiful face, long hair, and has embraced the character that God wants her to have, godly femininity. You see it. And the same thing with men who would dress as women and, and look effeminate and how God would take them and make them into men, embracing godly masculinity. It is a beautiful thing, but this is just a microcosm of what the gospel is to do in all of our lives. If it can save those who society tells us once they've entered that lifestyle, they can never leave. If it can save those, then it can save all of us. And that's the whole point of the gospel. That's the whole point of what Paul is saying here with the sacrifices of Jesus, the blood of bulls, the blood of goats, the sprinkling of ashes from a red heifer. None of those could transform the life like the blood of Jesus. And this is the part of our message when we're talking about 1844, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We have a message of real hope, not just that Jesus by fiat says, yeah, you're, you're clean. No, that he can truly make you clean. As we read in, in Hebrews chapter seven, that he can save you to the uttermost, that he can take your broken life and bring you in harmony with his image. This is the power of the gospel. This is why I believe, greater than Romans, that Hebrews contains the gospel, particularly for our time. Benita, were you going to say something? Amen. I just have 
Go ahead, Benita, are you there? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. No, I have I I didn't have anything. Okay. It 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 lit up on it lit up on my screen, so I didn't know if you had I did real quick. I just I did a study this morning. Um, well, I listened to a sermon this morning with the Holy Spirit, and uh, this gentleman went through the whole Bible, all the places that it shows up in creation, and then in uh, Revelation, the Spirit and the Bride say come, and the baptism, and all these things. But look right here, he missed this. I mean, eight says the Holy Spirit is signifying it. Fourteen puts him right in the middle. Yep. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself? without blemish to God. There's all three there and who's in the middle. It was right. just wow. Well, it, it this is this is what I this is what I you know that I'm not going to I'm not going to open the can of worms with the the debates about the Holy Spirit, but what what I can say about this passage, these passages that you just cited is just how important the Holy Spirit is to bring us in harmony with Christ. It is an agency mm -hmm. in heaven. That is, that is there to bring us to Christ, that is there to impress these words, to teach us the things about the shadows and about the true. And you can see it all there. And, and, and I, this is why I sometimes have issues when people want to diminish the ministry of the Spirit. It's there. Now, you don't have to define it perfectly. The, the most important thing you need to know is that you need to be sealed by it. If you're not sealed by it, you will not be of Christ. It's very clear in Romans chapter 8. If you do not have the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ, you are not His. You don't belong to Him. And so you need it. The church needs it. Again, Jesus Himself participated with it. The Spirit indicated through the teachings of the prophets and Moses that the way had not been yet made manifest. So, yeah, I, 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 I understand that there's sometimes these, these debates, and I, I've always said this in the midst of those debates, the devil is not really, he's not really uh, put off if you have a different definition of the Holy Spirit, or you don't think it's real, or this, or that, it doesn't bother him as much. What bothers him, or what he definitely doesn't want you to have, is to be sealed, is to be educated, and to be working with the Holy Spirit. That he doesn't want. He already saw what that looked like in Acts chapter 2. He doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. And and again, you like you like you pointed out Susan, it's all right there. And it's I was just so surprised that they missed that out of all that whole <laughs> and yeah. It. Yeah, no, I mean this this is this is right in your face and it's supposed to be. It's it's supposed to be. All right, so let's go to verses uh, 16, and we'll finish out the chapter, we'll finish out chapter 9. For, for where there is a testament, there also must be a necessity, the death of the testator. For the testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Okay, so, so um, any of you have had uh, relatives who have died and you have an official will, it actually says a will and testament. Um, if you did it legally, uh, if you just wrote it up on your own, it could say whatever. But th th this idea that the that the will and testament uh, is the idea that this this is a witness of what you desire, and Paul is making the point that this cannot be enforced until someone has died. The person who has written the will must die in order for it to be enforced, and this is important because nothing can be changed. Once the person dies, once the person dies, no amendments can be made to the will. Even human law respects that. You no, know, most courts in the United States will not amend or change a will. They will not. Once the person has died, it cannot be amended. It cannot be changed. That's just the way it is. And so courts generally respect what is written and, and understand its force after the person dies. This has always been very important. Uh, kingly successions were built on this. But, but here's something that, you, that I think is important as well, that you should understand. Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. If Jesus had made a change to the law, if he had done away with the Sabbath, if he had done anything, he would have had to do it before his death. He would have had to do it before his death because once he died, the covenant is now in force. 
there can be no changes to it after he dies. In other words, if he fulfilled the shadows, then they were fulfilled. Be- they were beginning to be fulfilled before he died, and that was the goal. The temple veil being torn in two told everyone that the tabernacle service, the temple service, would be no more. That happened right at his death. That cannot be altered. That cannot be changed. But what else cannot be altered and changed is the law. That cannot be altered or changed after the death of the testator. And again, I'm just pointing that out because that is powerful evidence that the new covenant cannot be radically different than the old covenant on that point, particularly the law, because Jesus never, not once, indicated that the law of God written in the Ten Commandments should be abolished. Not one part of it. Not one part of it. As a matter of fact, there are two times where men come to Jesus and ask him, what must I do to be saved? And you know what he says in both of them? He says, you know the commandments or you know the law. What is the reading of it? Think about that. If the law was to be done away with or abolished, he could have said right there, don't worry about that. As soon as I die, that's all done away with. You don't have to worry about it. You just have to know that I'm, I'm, I love you. Or you have to know that I, I'm going to die for you. That's all you have to know. But he doesn't say that. So this is a powerful argument against those who would tell us that the Sabbath is done away with. It is not. If it, The only time it could have been done away with was by Jesus himself. And what does he say? I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And then he goes on to say this. If anyone teaches, or sorry, if anyone breaks one of these commandments and teaches these men so, he shall be least in the kingdom of heaven. And if anyone teaches these, or if anyone uh, keeps these and teaches men these, then he will be considered great in the kingdom of heaven. Just what he says. So I just had to point that out. He goes on. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both, sprinkled both, both itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And then likewise he sprinkled the blood of the tabernacle and of the vessels and the ministry. And according to the law, and according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood, without Shed, without shedding of blood, there is no remission. But what is it? He goes on. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. These. So notice he makes it very clear that the blood of the new covenant, which is the blood of Christ, is, is what purifies the things in heaven that the things on earth were to be purified with blood and hyssop and, and wool and scarlet, but the true copy could only be purified with the blood of Jesus. And then he goes on, for Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands. Again, he has hammered this home every time. He hasn't entered anything that man made. This is in heaven. This is before the throne of God. This is the holiest of holies truly where no man can enter and live. Only Christ could purify these things, and only Christ's blood could actually make the people pure. He goes on, For Christ has not entered in the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but in the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's the goal, to put away sin. He didn't sin, so it would be our sin that he's going to put away. And it is, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation so the hope of those in the grave and the hope of those alive is the fact that christ has been offered once for sin and that he will come again and he will appear for our salvation for our reunion with him this is powerful 
as it's building the case, when people don't understand a heavenly sanctuary, it's because we don't understand the new covenant. Every aspect, whether the law is written in the heart, Jesus being our high priest, his blood purifying the, 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 the temple, all of it is based on the idea that there is a heavenly sanctuary, a heavenly sanctuary. And this is a part of the gospel that I believe that most Christians have left out. There is a heavenly sanctuary. There is a real process of purification that is going on. But again, that process must also correspond with us on earth because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what we are. And we can only be purified through the blood of Jesus. All right. Any questions, comments, or anything? And then we'll pick up on chapter 10 next week. That was awesome. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. It's Praise the Lord. I, again, I, Thank you, Tim. Hey, Thank praise you. the Lord. No problem. Glad, glad to hear you're doing all hey, right, Frank. Yep, yeah, doing fine as well as can be expected. Good, good. Hey, Tim. Yeah. Yes, Mark. I, I got you. Hey, hey Tim. Yes. Okay. And, um, and, and this goes to everybody. Um, my my neighbor Joe. I think is possibly coming to church with us tomorrow. He's of Catholic background. I don't know if he's been in church in years. Um, <clears throat> his wife's in a, in a nursing home. Anyway, he's like 72 or something. Anyway, um, I want to make sure that everybody greets him and is friendly to him. He really, to be honest with you, I don't think he has any friends other than me. And that sounds strange, but um I'm just blessed that if he comes to church and I've, I think I've convinced him to come to the uh, fellowship meal also. Amen. Well, so, uh, make sure, make sure you meet Joe guys. Yeah. Well, um, if I, Joe. if I don't, if I don't see him, you know, uh, let me know and I will definitely shake, well, I will definitely extend has, the right hand of fellowship. He has white hair and a white beard and, and he should be sitting with me and Maria, but actually I'll, I'll be moving up front. So probably sitting somewhere near Maria. Okay, sounds good. Well, I, I will pray about it. Yeah, please pray about it, guys. I, I really, I'm, I'm thankful that he's coming, and I'm hoping that he returns. That's well, that's it, my main. It, I mean, it, it's good because I won't be talking about the mark of the beast tomorrow. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably good. Yeah. I yeah. Wasn't yeah. Gonna, I mean, I, 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 I can always, I can always change it if you feel like he needs to hear it. But um, I already have something to plan. So. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't mind challenging someone, but you know, usually your first visit, you want to, you know, kind of. Yeah. No, no I'm just hoping that, that he feels welcome because he's, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I don't think he has any friends. It's just him and his wife. He's a real loner and he's always acted really strange, but I think it's all an act. Um, yeah. And he, need, he needs friends. And I, I told him that and he says, yeah, I know. So, um, I, I hope we give him a warm welcome. Absolutely. Or just keep the Pope out of it. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I mean, not worried you know, about that. You know, here's, here's the thing, though. I, I have family that's Catholic, and uh, they don't, you know, I have two different sides in my family. I have a, a very liberal side and a more conservative side. And it's funny, the more conservative side, we, we tend to get along, and they actually attend a mass where they, they celebrate in Latin. And they actually like like it when I pray. They've actually enjoyed when I've opened up the Bible with them. Um, <clears throat> I've, I actually talked to their priest, and I I said, you know, in the get go, I said, I right, listen, you and I aren't going to agree on eschatology. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, that's true. But we we had a very good conversation. But my point is this: is that um, when it came when it comes to the Pope, my my more conservative side of the Catholic family they don't call him Pope Francis. They call him Francis. They have mm -hmm. very little respect, respect for him because of his positions on homosexuality, his positions on abortion, his position on that climate change is somehow a sin that needs to be paid. As a matter of fact, they're even skeptical of a green Sabbath, which would honor Sunday, but they don't, they don't even think that's right. Now that tells you that the Holy Spirit is working I'm on people. My people. They're spread yes. right off the Catholic Church. Blend right down the middle. And so, you know, when you see this division in the church and you see these things happening, don't think 
that it's just the work of the devil. Remember, Jesus himself said that he came to divide and bring a sword. And sometimes that's necessary when that sword is truth. And we often say, oh, no, it's just the devil trying to divide us. No, no, no. What if it's actually the spirit of God agitating us to be divided over certain things? What if the, the reason why people are, are being bothered and, and calling things out is because that's what needs to happen? Mm-hmm. Don't ever think that the, the work of God is to bring rainbows and sunshine and flowers and, and, and little hearts and chocolates and, and bunnies and, and puppies. That's what? not. It's, it's not? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, I've been coming around for the wrong reasons. Yeah, you, you've been waiting for all that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> not even bagels, Frank. It's not even about bagels. Yeah. Stop. So stop right there or else you'll lose me forever. (laughs) But, you know, the the point is, is that sometimes it's God's will that there's going to be some agitation, that there's going to be some friction, that there's going to be some division. I mean, just yes. And, And here's the thing. If you read, if you read everything that you find in the Gospels that Jesus said, right? You would read that and say, well, gosh, that can't possibly be, you know, that bad. I mean, there were some times where he he said, you know, I, you know, your sins are forgiven and that nearly got him killed. But, you know, I mean, you think about that. I mean, he literally a man was lowered on a on a on a litter before him. And he and he says, your sins are forgiven. And the, of course, the, 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 the religious leaders there got upset and said, well, no one can forgive sins but God alone. And Jesus looked at him and said, what do you think is easier? I say to this man, your sins are forgiven or to take up your bed and walk. But to show you that the son of man has power of both, I say, take up your bed and walk. Now, I, I get that that would make them mad, but wouldn't you be happy? Wouldn't you be happy that the Messiah would be around? Wouldn't you be excited that this man who was about to die, who had to be lowered, who couldn't possibly move, he was healed? Wouldn't you be happy about that? But the answer is no. The answer is no, that they weren't. And even though Jesus, to me, does not seem like a rabble rouser or someone who's just purposely wanting to stir up strife just by doing the very works that God had commanded him to do was too much for the religious leaders. And so my point is, is that even if you just live a God fearing life and you stand for truth, you may find that that alone is enough to bring strife. And sometimes that's what's meant to happen. Again, some of us would be a little turned off by John the Baptist method, and I get it. It's not nice to say to a bunch of people, you brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And do not say to yourself that you have Abraham as our father, for God can make children of Abraham from these stones. I mean, that's pretty brutal. But guess what? He was moved by the Holy Spirit to say that. And Jesus says, of all men born of John, the uh, sorry, of all men born of women, there are none greater than John the Baptist. And of course, he says, he who is in the least in heaven is greater than he, which means that you definitely want to make it to heaven. But the point of the matter is, is that sometimes, sometimes these things, these divisions need to happen and it needs to be said. And so when I look at the division in the Catholic church, I see that people are thinking and they're searching. And I see when I see the division in our church, I, while I don't like going through it, I see an awakening. I see people going back to their Bibles. And listen, the division just isn't in our church, the Catholic church. It's in the Baptist church. It's in the Methodist church. It's in the Lutheran church. It's, it's interesting. Very interesting to see. It. It's across the board. And again, this gets back to come out of her, my people. This tells us that God is still working. And in the midst of the strife, in the midst of this disagreement, in the midst of these problems, God is still working. There Sorry to go off on that. But I was very is, impressed uh, with this basketball team down south that uh, they're very, very, it's our church, our school, and they uh, are really good players. And they refused to go to the finals because they wouldn't change it off the Sabbath. And so wow. they made a statement. They, they, they reneged on their, uh, they're not going to go through with it. Oh, good for them. I'm glad someone had some backbone and said, no, I mean, that's, that's amen. Because what does it matter if you gain the whole world, but you lose your life or your soul? And what would a man give in exchange of his soul? You know, I, I remember years ago, 
years ago, there was a, there was a guy who, he was a, a Olympic uh, speed skater and he won the silver medal. And after he won the silver medal, he said, this is really a silly thing. He goes, there are many more issues that are more important about this. And I believe he began to talk about human trafficking. And of course, you never heard of him again. You never heard of him again. You didn't hear anything. And even at one time, there was an interview that they did with Tom Brady, who has won so many accolades in pro football. And he even said, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, these are just trophies. There are other things more important than, than, than just trophies. And these are people who have things that men covet and would be willing to do every evil thing to obtain. But it speaks to us that there is a truly a greater reality than the highest accolades that this world has to offer. And though we definitely covet the, the approbation of our fellow man and, and, and to have friends and to have success in this world, even people who have obtained the highest levels of success admit that there's something still greater and there's something more important. And that more important for us is in the gospel of Jesus Christ and in the revelation of Jesus Christ that we find in prophecy. So any other comments, any, any last things, and then we'll pray and wrap it up. Okay, let's pray. Gracious and heavenly father, I thank you for your Holy spirit. I thank you for it because this is what has inspired the scriptures. This is what helps us to understand the ministry of our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. This is to help us understand what our mission is and, and why we even exist as a people, because there is an important truth in the Bible that needs to be pointed out that it's not about just wearing a t-shirt of righteousness, that truly the blood of Jesus can purify us from dead works, that it can save us to the uttermost, that it can take us as a broken and fallen uh, wreck of humanity and bring us in harmony with you. This is the whole goal. This is the point of the purifying of the sanctuary, cleansing the sanctuary, both in heaven and on the earth. These truths are so powerful. And I pray that it will sink into our hearts that we will believe whole, wholly that we truly have a message for this world and the time that we're living in. We thank you for this, Lord. Please be with each and every one of us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Sorry, I couldn't turn off. Oh, no problem. What were you going to say? Yeah, someone asked about the veil earlier. Yes. And I was on mute. Um, oh, what were you going to say? Jesus said, I am the door. I'm the way, the truth, and, and the life, right. And the door. And even though the door is, um, when you enter the sanctuary, it is also, you know, the veil. Mm -hmm. And so every is the significance of Christ, everything. Amen. So. Amen. I, that, that's why I, I, I believe in, I believe I have good evidence on this, but the veil represented his humanity, which was torn, which was broken for us. And once that was removed, then the, the way from the holy to the most holy is now open because of Christ, which is like you said, he's the door, he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. All of those things are important for the sanctuary. Uh, he is the path. He is the door. And he is he is the life, which is his blood. And, of course, the truth. So, yes, I thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. You all have a wonderful night and uh, looking forward Happy to seeing Sabbath. some of you tomorrow. Happy Glenn, Sabbath. Happy Glenn, Sabbath. Did you take this? Okay, great, great, great. Thank you. Good night.